Hello everybody, my name is Chris D'Agostino and um, I'd like to welcome you guys to my SYP. And what I've been doing for the last two months is I've been looking at ways in which theater can, participation in theater can help kids on the autistic spectrum cope with the symptoms of autistic spectrum disorders. Now, um, you might ask, okay, so what does this have to do with me? Um, when I was in the fifth grade, I was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome, and I really feel as though my participation in theater has really helped me um, deal with a lot of the symptoms. And but before I want before I go into sort of the main meat of my argument, I just want to establish two things. First, when I talk about autistic spectrum disorders, I want you guys to know that I'll be speaking in generalizations. I'll be talking about how people with ASDs often lack. Um, you know, social skills, but this doesn't apply to everyone. This, some people struggle less with it, some people struggle more with it. And um, the second thing is, before I get to my argument, I want to first establish what exactly is autism, because the definition of an autistic spectrum disorder is changing as we speak. So I'm just going to read to you guys an up-to-date um, definition of it, and then I'm going to sort of explain it. It's impairment in reciprocal social interactions, communications, which can be verbal, nonverbal, or both, and a repertoire of restrictive or repetitive behavior. Now, I'm going to get into a lot of this sort of afterwards, um, a lot of these aspects, but first I just want to focus on um, nonverbal communication. People with ASDs often struggle with understanding the significance of body language, understanding the significance of, say, um, Facial expressions. I'm going to give you guys two scenarios. Okay, so I have, um, so here's my friend Jimmy, right? And I have an ASD, and I'm talking to Jimmy, right? And I'm talking to Jimmy about one of my favorite subjects. I'm talking, I'm talking, I'm talking, and Jimmy's trying to communicate to me that he doesn't want to talk to me. He's trying to use his not his um, nonverbal expressions. He's trying to look away from me. He may turn in the other direction. He's not making eye contact. Now. <clears throat> He's trying to convey to me that he doesn't want to talk to me, even though he can't really tell me, Chris, I don't want to talk to you because that's rude. Now, I can't really understand this, and I have trouble interpreting this, so I keep on talking. And the other aspect is the presentation in nonverbal communication. Like, I'm going to bring in Jimmy again. Okay, so I'm having a heated argument with Jimmy, and um, we're sitting down. And I, um, I'm sort of in a lean back position. Um, and uh, Jimmy doesn't think I'm really taking him seriously because he interprets my, my body and he says, okay, I, you're not really taking me seriously, even though I think I'm taking the situation seriously. But I don't understand the impact of my nonverbal behavior on Jimmy. Okay. Before I get into my argument, I just want to establish what are the types of ASDs. The first one is uh, classical autism. Classical autism is typically the most severe form of autism, characterized by verbal difficulties. Now, what this means is that people with classical autism, they often have limited vocabulary. Some of them can't even really speak at all. Um, and then I'm just going to talk about Asperger's syndrome. Now, in Asperger's syndrome, verbal difficulties are not really part of the diagnosis but what's more part of the diagnosis is the nonverbal difficulties that I was talking about later. And PDD-NOS, which stands for Pervasive Developmental Disorder Not Otherwise Specified, are people who qualify for ASDs, but they don't really fit either category. Now here is my first argument of why theater can help kids overcome symptoms of ASDs. Self-awareness. Theater emphasizes um, it emphasizes intention, what you want and how you're going to get it. So let's say I am portraying a character and my friend Jimmy across from me is also portraying a character and my character wants all of his money. I'm not going to tell him straight away, it probably won't be written in the script, that I want all of Jimmy's money. I will have to portray in other ways how I want Jimmy's, Jim, Jimmy's mon money. So I may uh, sort of be a little intimidating. I may incorporate that into my body language, or I may, um, or I may sort of play the nice guy a little bit. And these sort of ways can can not only help you act, but it can help you in social situations. And um, 
I was talking a little bit about sort of um, the uh, the physical aspect of of it. You know, oftentimes if I want something, I will present myself in a way that is physically um, dominating. And I actually found something really interesting in a recent TED talk about how physical presentation actually encourages confidence. Like, let's say I'm portraying Henry V in Shakespeare. I'm portraying Henry V in Shakespeare, and I'm sort of, I need to sort of portray myself, body language, in a way that's um, dominating and, um, I don't want to say scary, but yeah, dominating. And what this actually does is that the way I'm acting um, with my physical presentation, it influences the way I think. So what this does is this increases testosterone levels and it decreases cortisol levels, which reduce stress. So actually, by acting in a way that, um, if, and by acting as a leader, I actually sort of become more of a leader. So, I go to the next part, emotional intelligence. What is emotional intelligence? Emotional intelligence is the awareness of one's own emotions and moods and those with others, according to the World English Dictionary. So my interpretation of emotional intelligence is just, um, it's um, being aware of your own emotions and the emotions of others. Now, what I found interesting is that imitation or interpretations of another person's actions assist with emotional intelligence. Like, um, often in acting, you may incorporate characteristics of someone else into your presentation. And um, this is very important. You draw from your environment and you incorporate it to you. I don't want to talk so much about imitation because unless if you're portraying Gandhi and you're observing everything that Gandhi does and you're, and you're fully imitating him, it's usually not um, incorporated in acting. This is your brain on imitation. Now, before this scares you, I'm just going to read a quote regarding the insular cortex, the, insular, the anterior insula section of the brain. In the anterior insula section of the brain, which we see in red, visual information concerning the emotions of others is directly mapped as a result of imitation onto the same motor neural structures that determine the experience of that emotion in that observer. Okay, let me translate this to you. Okay, let's say I am imitating someone. Um, let's say I am imitating, say, um, a clown. So I'm imitating a clown, and I sort of, I'm acting really jovial and everything, and so the visual information of the clown is mapped into the interior insula cortex, which is then mapped onto my own emotions. I can kind of empathize with the clown. Yeah, empathize, empathize with the clown. Or if I'm portraying Gandhi, I can sort of empathize more with Gandhi. So, and this, and this really incorporates, you know, other people's perspectives, because the thing about emotional, the thing about people with ASDs is they have a hard time incorporating perspectives of other people. Okay, here is sort of the last part of my argument, which is trying something new. Now, if acting is a good way to, to sort of deal with symptoms of ASDs, then improv is an excellent way. Now, let me demonstrate this to you. I'm going to talk about a symptom of an ASD that I, that was brought up earlier, but I really didn't have time to get to. Okay, so a uh, symptom is uh, repetitive and restrictive behavior and thoughts. Now let me first illustrate repetitive thoughts. Okay, so um, every time I go to Great Harvest, I order a grilled cheese panini with garlic spread and bacon. This is every time, I just had one right now. So, <laughs> what this does, is it establishes sort of a routine way of thinking. I kind of, there's this planned mentality incorporated into it. And then there's also repetitive and restrictive verbal, no, I'm sorry, um, repetitive and restrictive physical behavior. Like when I was um, four or five years old, I would do this. And so, and uh, my theory of why these two things happen is because people with ASDs insist on things being the same. They insist sort of to control the world around them. And um, 
Like for example, I can control what I eat. I can, by, by moving like this, I control something about my environment because my environment's constantly changing and I can control my physical presentation. So what improv does, improv, so first of all, let me just establish this sort of planned mentality in ASDs. Oftentimes because, you know, like I mentioned the thing like I, I order a grilled cheese panini every time I go to Great Harvest. I, I don't, I kind of, I, I don't think while I'm act, while, while I act. I, if I thought while I acted, I would go to Great Harvest and sort of order on the spot in the moment, but I sort of, I sort of need to plan beforehand. So here's the separation of thought and doing. And what improvisation does is you can't think before you do. Like let's say I'm, impro I'm improvising with Jimmy, and Jimmy sets up a situation, like he says, um, um, I want a refund for this tomato. I can't sort of say, I can't, um, I had no time to think of what to do in response to that. I have to unify perception and action in order for improv to work. And um, this actually brings comfort from discomfort because if I learn that by acting and thinking at the same time, I, it's, you know, it, it's not that bad to think and act at the same time. Sometimes I come up with something's funny. This kind of incorporates a new way of thinking for someone with an ASD. And yeah, it helps some um, people with ASDs sort of grow confidence in sort of the in the moment ways of thinking. So here's a rebuttal you may have for me. So, okay, Chris, I may believe what you're saying, but how come if theater is so great for treating autism, why isn't it taken why isn't it taken seriously? among psychologists, or sort of um, people in the science field. Now, this one interview I had sort of summed that up for me. This is, this is her opinion. She said, science and art have a very awkward relationship. In order um, for science to work, you have to take quantitative measures of things. Like, let's say I'm doing a science experiment, and um, I'm measuring the amount of sodium I have before and after a chemical reaction. Okay, so I have, um, 100 grams before, one, 200 grams afterwards, there's a 100 plus gain. Now here's the question that I'm gonna propose to you guys. How do you measure social progress? How do you measure artistic progress? I, you, is it like, oh, I, um, I uh, gained 0.5 points in social skills today? It, it's, very, it's very weird and it's a little bit awkward. <laughs> so, here's my conclusion. From my, from my two, two to three months of research, the amount of evidence to support theater for autism has been overwhelming. It's almost as if theater was made for people on the autistic spectrum. And I just want to sort of get a takeaway message. So I just want to sort of present a takeaway message, which is I don't want you guys to get the impression that autism is all bad and all the symptoms of autism need to be corrected because, because many great people um, like uh, Albert Einstein was suspected of having Asperger's syndrome, and Isaac Newton uh, was suspected of having um, Asperger's syndrome as well. Because of their rigid ways of thinking, they they were able to accomplish great things. But what I'm going to argue that theater does, theater incorporates sort of a new perspective into things. It kind of it helps eliminate sort of the black and whiteness and the rigidness of thinking, and incorporates sort of you know, spon spontaneous action while you're thinking. Um, that's my presentation, and are there any questions? <laughs>